The Rings of Power, a title that fills the hearts of Tolkien fans with dread, sorrow, pain, and complete misery. Sometimes all of it at once. I must admit, it's hard to say the title without a sigh of utter disgust and disappointment. I am, of course, biased. I have a profound love for Tolkien's works. Why else would I have this channel? And the show is barely Tolkien in any way. In fact, I could argue it's the complete opposite in so many ways. But I feel I've already done that in some of my older videos and reviews. But the show did at least manage to capture one Tolkienian thing. A world in decline. Our world. Somehow everything only seems to be in decline and gets worse. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. But at the same time, it's hard not to long for something as glorious as Peter Jackson's adaptations of The Lord of the Rings. It's been more than 20 years since The Return of the King came out. Hard to believe. They just don't make movies like these anymore, do they? Anyway, there are those out there trying to spin the series as a success. And to that I can only laugh and shake my head. As I covered last year, the series is an official failure. As I mentioned back then, some people believe that everything in this world is simply a subjective opinion. But when it comes to filmmaking, storytelling and screenwriting, there are certain rules to follow. And when you break them, it often means the movie is bad. Even though the audience might find it hard to point out exactly what made it bad, boring or something of that sort. Let me give you a quick example, before we dive into the rumours of season 2. Imagine you're watching a movie about a detective trying to solve a murder. After watching one hour of this film, there's suddenly a scene where the detective is at the supermarket to buy toilet paper, and he runs into his old high school friend Dave. They chat for a few minutes, and then it's never brought up again. The toilet paper has no relevancy, and Dave completely leaves the story without making a difference. Hopefully it's clear why that's bad storytelling. It actually ties to a different element in screenwriting, called Chekhov's Gun. In short, it's about setups and payoffs, which you might have heard about. It simply means that if the camera shows someone putting a gun in a drawer, the gun needs to play a role before the end of the story. Sadly, this can also ruin certain films for you. Perhaps the camera focuses on a baseball bat on the wall for a second, before panning down to a character. Now you know, someone is going to use that baseball bat. Those are simply the rules. Among many others, of course. The Rings of Power lacked many things, especially subtlety. And it's one of the things that made it so goddamn boring. You never really get a chance to think for yourself. Stuff just simply happens. But this video is not simply to bash the Rings of Power all day, though that would be easy. Instead I want to talk about some of the rumours we have for Season 2. We got 20 bullet points listed on the OneRing.net, taken from 4chan. In the past their leaks have been very accurate, so there's a good chance most of these rumours will become true, if not all of them. So let's jump right into it. Amazon has newly expanded rights to the plot points from the Silmarillion. I highly doubt they got the rights to the entire Silmarillion. It seems so unlikely, both based on their stance in the past and how badly received the series was, will and still is. In season 1, we already saw there are certain things they managed to include, even though it's not actually part of the rights they hold. I think the most famous example is using the name Amenelos for the capital of Numenor, but they also named Ras Mortil on their map, which comes from the Unfinished Tales. So it's likely more of the same. They've managed to get the rights for certain things, but not the entire book. I'd assume it's linked to Galadriel in some way, Sauron, and Morgoth. And the next couple of points will probably prove that. Let's move to the points between 2 and 6. Season 2, Episode 1. Opening scene is Eero using the secret flame to create Milkor. Milkor then watches as Eero creates all the Valar and Maya. Eero is a disembodied voice, vaguely human shaped, but no characteristics can be made out. The secret flame is golden, as are all the Valar and the Maya. The Valar are larger than the Maya, but are bathed in a golden light and completely naked. So the opening scene will feature the Ainur Lindale, the music of the Ainur. We will get to see the creation of Milkor and all the Valar and the Maya. So just to make it clear, this is taken from the Silmarillion, the very first chapter. It's quite unique if they're actually allowed to depict this, but I have a feeling they'll change it from the original form, as they've done with everything else in the show so far. Suddenly following the law would be a shocker to us all. Point 7 and 8. Sauron will be played primarily by three actors in Season 2. Sauron in Maeran form and Kaltsach 
is not Hellbrand or Anatar. I assume most of us have already heard this. When the Fellowship of Fans announced around Christmas that this guy will be playing Sauron. <sighs> I don't believe it was explicitly stated that he would be Anatar, but I guess we shouldn't be surprised that Amazon is going to have an Indian looking version of Anatar. Talk about giving fans what they want. Eh? Anyway, there's apparently also a third guy that will play Sauron, or Myron. I think this will bring a lot of confusion to people. I can recall from Game of Thrones that at least some people were quite baffled when the access for Dario and the mountain were changed. So it's a bold move. Based on the script we had for season 1, I don't think the showrunners can pull it off. They simply don't have the wits for it. Instead it might feel like three guys all claiming to be Sauron. But we will see. We will see. Let's look at the points between 9 and 12 that always tied to the music of the Ainu as well. After the fourth interruption of the song, several Maya meet and discuss Melkor's discordance. Mithrandir is in this scene. Mithrandir is almost convinced to support Myron's agenda. Myron gives an epic speech. I'm not going to say it here. You can just read it on screen. So the discord of Melkor will actually be part of the scene, and apparently Gandalf is part of a meeting discussing this afterwards. I'm fairly certain it will be in his form as Ulorin, and not as an old bearded man, but then again, it's made by Amazon and they don't care about the law. I think it's unique they call him Mithrandir, because that means the Great Wanderer, and that is clearly a name given to him as an old man, as Gandalf, walking in Middle-earth. Uh, so, you know, doesn't really make sense, but I guess they couldn't use the name Olorin. Based on the rights they have acquired, we might also have some of the other named Maya, like Eonwe, and perhaps Saruman, as Kuromo. But we will see. I guess the shocking thing here is that Gandalf is almost convinced to support Sauron's agenda. Of course we don't know what that agenda might be, but it's likely nothing good. And at the same time, Gandalf doesn't really strike me as the kind of guy that would fall for Sauron's tricks. But perhaps early on. I don't know. I'm not a fan of the idea at least. It does seem like they'll make Sauron as Myron a rather active character from the start. Hopefully they won't forget to show us how he too falls victim to the corruption of Milkor. Let's move on to the next. Sauron tells the dwarves he apprenticed on the Aule, so they welcome him with open arms. So apparently Sauron is welcomed by the dwarves. It's kind of unspecific if we're talking about the early history of Middle-earth. All of these are the dwarves of Khazad Doom. The dwarves are notorious for not falling prey to Sauron's tricks and manipulations. Perhaps the most famous example is how their rings doesn't make them the slaves of Sauron's will, unlike the nine men. It is true, though, that he originally was an apprentice of Aule, and this line is not far from something Tolkien actually wrote, but it was in regards to the Noldor of Eregion when he disguised himself as Anatar. A letter from September 1954. At the beginning of the Second Age, he, Sauron, was still beautiful to look at, but could still assume a beautiful visible shape. I was not indeed wholly evil, not unless all reformers who want to hurry up with reconstruction and reorganization are wholly evil. Even before pride, and the last to accept their will eat them up. The particular branch of high elves concerned, the Noldor or Lawmasters, were always vulnerable on the side of science and technology, as we should call it. They wanted to have the knowledge that Sauron genuinely had. And those of Eregion refused the warnings of Gilgalad and Elrond. The particular desire of the Eregion elves, an allegory, if you like, of a love of machinery and technical devices, is also symbolized by their special friendship with the dwarves of Moria. You know, that actually sounds interesting, unlike the show. That has already deviated a lot from this, and it's quite a change if Anatar is welcomed in Casa Doom before entering Eregion. Sauron had a son who Adar killed. <sighs> now it starts sounding like Amazon again. In the early versions of the Legendarium, some of the Valar actually had children, but Tolkien abandoned this idea. So what about Maya? The most well-known and only example is Melian having a child with the elven king Thingol. It's meant to be a very unique case though, and in the nature of Middle-earth, we also learn that Maya can't simply reproduce with any species. Melian assumed, as the Valar and Maya could, the raiment of the children, the incarnates, out of love for them. Only one of the greatest of the Eldar, the early vigor, could have supported a union of that sort, unique in all known tales. But Melian, having in woman form born a child, after the manner of the Incarnate, 
decided to do this no more. By the birth of Luthien, she became enmeshed in incarnation, unable to lay it aside while husband and child remained in Arda alive. Her powers of mind, especially foresight, became clouded by the body through which it must now always work. To have borne more children would still further have chained her and trammeled her. In the event, her daughter became mortal and eventually died, and her husband was slain, and she then cast off her raiment and left Middle-earth. But to keep it short, no. Sauron did not have any children, and they certainly wasn't killed by a guy called Daddy. <sighs> now I'm mostly wondering who the mother would be, and why. I fear she will play a role in all this before the end. I guess the worst idea would either be Ungoliant or Shelob. And given how dumb the show have been so far, I'm already calling it out. Point 15 and 16. Horse Lovers Rejoice, a dedicated bottle episode with little dialogue, will tell the story of the first Mayaras, Felorov, and introduce Shadowfax. Gandalf, meet your man, meet Shadowfax. So we will get the backstory of the famous horses of the Rohirrim. It grieves me, as that story belongs to the Third Age, and not the Second Age. But so does Gandalf. At least it's even more certain now that Meteor Man is Gandalf and not a blue wizard, as some die-hard fans of the show have tried to argue for. Point 17 to 19. Tom Bombadil and Goldberry are in an episode. They're played by the same actor and actress as Milkor and Ungoliant from episode 1. The pair as Bombadil and Goldberry are serving out a punishment from Mandos per a long-held fan theory. Ah, uh, yes. Now the true heresy is revealed again. First of all, no. If that's a fan theory, it gotta be the worst of them all. I wouldn't even call it fan fiction. It's just plain out dumb. It goes against everything we know, and even something Tolkien specifically said in some of his letters. So no, no, no. Not only are the characters complete opposites, but it goes against established law in so, so many ways. For years fans have longed to see Tom Bombadil depicted, and then we get this Antichrist version of him. How wonderful. I wonder who approved this preposterous idea. I guess the showrunners thought they were clever. But to me, they just again proved their point. I don't know nothing about Tolkien, nothing about Middle-earth. And based on their statements in the past, I'm doubting if they even read The Lord of the Rings. It is simply absurd. But let's move to the last rumor. Point 20. The season will end with Sauron forging the One Ring. Not a surprise at all. I assume we will see the creation of the other rings, had to dwarfs and men. A common misconception is that the rings were also made for these races. But they were in fact made for the elves. I'm certain they will get this part wrong as well, as they seem to know little about the law, or at least don't care about it. To call this a series based on Tolkien's works, it's as true as saying Disney only wants what's best for your children. A filthy lie clouded by greed and dishonor. So now you might be wondering why I would torment myself and watch season 2. Why bother talking about this series at all? Well, because one have to speak up about this madness. And how they disgrace Tolkien's works. While around 99% of the show is pure nonsense, it does allow me to talk about some of the smaller details of the world that is often forgotten or rarely talked about. And based on your comments, it seems to interest at least some of you. I must admit, I'm a harsh critic, but that applies to all things in life. If people can do better, I think they should know. And that's also why I gave season 1 a score of 0.5 out of 10. It's not Tolkien, and sadly for all of us, it's not good either. Covering the Rings of Power have been good in one way at least. It's been a fine way to grow the channel and earn a few pennies. Profit has never been my aim, however, and most of what I've earned have been invested in my own Second Age series. Currently episode 1 and 2 are out, and you might be wondering where the rest of season 1 is. I'm still working on it. I've invested more than $2,000 in it, mainly for artworks, depicting locations and characters rarely or never depicted before. It's the sole reason why I don't see a lot of videos posted here on the channel anymore. I'm investing a ton of my spare time into this series. I've written most of the scripts. Hopefully the episodes will come out before Season 2 of The Rings of Power, but I can't make any promises. I want to thank all the members here on YouTube and all the patrons over on Patreon. They'll get early access to the episodes whenever they're ready. As always, 
Thank you all for watching and being part of the Council of the Rings. Farewell till next time.